Excellency General Muhammad Buhari, former Head of State, Your Excellency Elijah Mubaka Atiku, former Vice President, my Lord, Honorable Justice Muhammad Mawad Wais, former Chief Justice of Nigeria, Your Excellencies, my brother governors, Your Excellencies, former governors, serving and former senators and parliamentarians, distinguished and eminent Nigerians, but most especially our celebrant and his wife, my brother, Governor Jimmy Prey Silva, and his wife, Mrs. Alaini Silva, and their children, on whose behalf we gather today. Let me first thank Governor Silva for using the occasion of the 50th anniversary of his birth to convoke a discussion, as it were, about issues that challenge the Nigerian nation. It truly could have been otherwise. And when he asked me to be speaker at this event, I did not hesitate in accepting the very privileged information, invitation that I considered it to be. But that said, let me confess that he gave me a few topics for me to consider, but it was also easy for me to choose the topic of the day. And in the sense that I will seek to locate the discussion of this topic with our day-to-day -day experiences here. And uh, thank him. But whatever happens after, I will take responsibility for what I say. But Governor Silva will take responsibility for inviting me. <laughs> Now, I don't think that our discussion will be helped by attempting to make any more formal definition of democracy. I think that it will serve our purpose simply to proceed by understanding that it is participatory governance in the sense that we all have a say whether we vote or not. I think it is also useful to remind ourselves that participation is largely by representation. In other words, those who are old enough to vote and those who are not are represented by people elected to speak, to think, and to act on their behalf. This part is very important simply because we all cannot be in government especially in the executive and the legislative panel. So we must elect or otherwise choose people to go there on our behalf. The problem can be compounded by size. And if you imagine what a Senate or a House of Representatives or other parliament, where all of 160 million plus of us are still counting, can sit down and daily discuss what our problems are. You can only imagine what kind of architectural monument that kind of building would be. So from this point, we can see the inherent challenges that lie in the process of collective decision making. In order to further highlight some of the challenges that lie in democratic governance, I will share with you a report of development across the world, published by the Newsweek magazine, a 2010 edition, but which continues to remain relevant. It was titled, The Best Countries in the World, Newsweek Top 100. And it was an article by Raina Furuha. She posed the following question before delivering the report of a survey of 100 nations. Quote, if you were born today, which country would provide you the very best opportunity to live a healthy, safe, reasonably prosperous, and upwardly mobile life? End of quote. In the answer, Finland was number one. Nigeria was number 99. 
Ghana was number 86. South Africa was number 82. Brazil was number 48. Singapore was number 20. The United States was number 11. The United Kingdom was number 14. At the time, Greece had very serious economic problems and debt crisis, but she was still number 26. Russia was number 51. The United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia that are not democracies in the contemporary sense that we know it. We are rated 43, 53, 54, and 64 respectively. Out of the 53 African countries that were rated, only 18 made the ranking. The highest being Tunisia, that was 65, Morocco, that was rated 67, and Egypt, that was rated 74. South Africa, which was then the biggest economy in Africa in 2010, ranked lower than these undemocratic North African countries at 82. As if that was not bad enough, earlier this year, whilst I was on a trip to Abu Dhabi, I was forced to enter into a conversation with a middle-aged man of Arab extraction. It was in the evening in our hotel. He had come out to the restaurant to dine and apparently to unwind. I ended up on the same table with him, and he was insisted on making a conversation while he drank a, red, a glass of red wine. In the event, he sought to know where I came from, and when I said Nigeria, he accused our government of pauperizing our countrymen when we have oil, like his own country, Saudi Arabia. When I told him that he was not supposed to drink alcoholic wine, he asked me if I was going to report to his country. <laughs> when I reminded him that his country was not democratic, he hit me where it hurt most. He asked what the value of democracy is to my own countrymen, when his own countrymen can build hospitals and we bring our own alien presidents to. As if this was not enough, he rounded up by saying to me that in his country, they see what their leaders are doing with their money. Building roads for them, bridges, new airports, schools, hospitals, the rail project, shopping malls, and generally driving development. And he at least did not care about democracy. Although I felt hot that he thought very little of my country. The idea of the freedoms to think to speak, and to ask questions is too valuable for me to exchange for development under an autocratic or undemocratic government. If the only options left for me to choose were between freedom and development, I for one would rather surrender development than freedom. So I worry, as we must all worry, when I hear some people saying today that it is part of their achievement that they allow us to express ourselves. I think that is utter rubbish. I think also that they seek to define the relationship. The relationship where they are supposed to serve us. And therefore, I cannot imagine somebody that any one of us employs to serve us saying that we must feel privileged or allowing us to complain that the job is not being well done. However, I remain convinced beyond doubt that democracy can still deliver development. And this is the central theme of my presentation. And I start first from the political parties because they are critical to the democratic process, especially in Nigeria where you cannot hold any political office unless you belong to a political party. And for me, it seems that if we must achieve development with democracy, the vehicle of politics, the political parties, must first be developed as first-class institutions. The first thing to seek is the idea behind government, 
And this is often contained in the program of a political party. It is very important because the extremes of left and right ideologies have perhaps now converged around the center. Indeed, if China and Russia are democratizing, are democratizing even if some say they are doing so imperfectly, it is clear that the communist or socialist ideologies of economic exchange have proven to become unsustainable. Capitalism itself, in its purest sense, has also had to reinvent itself. Capitalism started on the principle of no credit, everything must be cash. But clearly, capitalism has moved from crash to credit. And for those of us who remember, it is credit itself that almost killed capitalism recently. The question of ideology is important because it lies at the heart of the choice making for people who participate in elections to choose their representatives. At all times, the welfare of the people is a central theme for the canvassing of votes. It is the ideology, often economic outlook, sometimes on the social outlook, that helps to crystallize the difference between the political party machineries. Before concluding on party ideology, because I think that this subject itself can take more than a full lecture, let me say that while some people still delude themselves that there is no difference between our political parties, especially the ruling party and the APC, the main opposition, the differences are emerging daily for those who are discerning enough to notice them. If on major policy issues such as power, security, agriculture, corruption, and unemployment, the main opposition has disagreed with the party in government and has criticized its choices, I wonder what else the party needs to do to prove that there is a difference. If you look at the level of progress and development in the states governed by the old and new opposition parties and governments, there is a clear daylight in terms of development. For example, it is no coincidence that only two states, Lagos and Rivers, governed now by APC governments, are executing rail projects on their own mass transit solutions. The party in government has lied about when there will be stable electricity for 16 years. And an APC state, Lagos, has led the way in showing what is possible with its power initiatives in Egli, Akuti, Lagos Island, and Alausa, Ikeja, and Leki power plants will be delivered later this year. The party in power prefers to continue to import fuel with the attendant destructions and monumental corruption. It cancelled its own concession of moribund refineries. Lagos believes that in a strategic partnership, it is possible if it provides land for Nigeria to produce enough petroleum products for consumption and still have the same to export within a four-year period. And the ruling party, in spite of his lies, is also now sending a clear message to the people. And this is what they are saying. I'm trying to paraphrase all of what they have said into a paragraph. It's different. But this is what they are saying. We care about you. But you do not need development. So we will not do any developmental work in three years. In the fourth year, we will give you money. We will give you kerosene and we will give you rice. Please vote for us. And use the money we give you to provide your own roads, your own schools, your own hospitals, and security until we see you again in four years' time. End of course. In the last election in Oshun, the APC candidates sought the people's vote on a campaign anchored first on its record of four years and a clear developmental and economic agenda to empower the people if re-elected. For the candidate of the other main party, the election was going to be a war. 
So said no less a person than the Vice President of our country, a leading member of that party. The candidate therefore anchored his campaign on an intention to capture Oshun. For me, there is clear daylight between these two approaches. Anyone who still pretends not to see this major economic ideological difference will not see the tallest building in the world, even if it stands in front of it. Now I will go to people and members of that party, because I've started from the structure of democracy itself as a political party. I will now go to the people of the society and the, and the members of the party. And I will start this part with a quote from Bertolt Brecht. And this is what he said, quote, the worst illiterate is the political illiterate. He hears nothing, sees nothing, takes no part in political life. He doesn't seem to know that the cost of living, the price of beans, of flour, of rent, of medicines, all depend on political decisions. He who prides himself on his political ignorance, he sticks out his chest and says that he hates politics. He doesn't know the imbecile that from his political non-participation comes the prostitute, the abandoned child, the robber, and worst of all, corrupt officials, the lackeys of exploitative multinational corporations. End of it. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you may have heard this. So many will say, I don't want to get involved. Politics is too dirty. But in that sense, we create a very big gap. It is regrettable that majority of members of our political parties and politicians do not yet incorporate and include the critical elite of our society. They still see politics as something too dirty. Whether we like it or not, history has shown that the elite of any society, especially its professional cadre, and the very best of them, decide the direction of the nation when they come to a consensus about the political pathway for their nation even if they belong to different political parties. So I ask, where are all the people who have built things with their hands in our country? What are they doing outside government? Where are the founders of our great banks, our great businesses, our telecoms, in our body politic? Are they just content to finance politics and yet remain unwilling to take the plunge? There is unverifiable talk, and I repeat, unverifiable talk, that some of them are willing to identify with the ruling party where they are in Abuja, and also willing to identify with the party and government in their states when they get back to their bases for fear of the crisis. I ask, what do our elite believe? It is only by their belief which will inform the contributions they can make to fund parties where members pay their dues, where strong values restrain people from decamping whenever the grass is no longer green, that we can really define the kind of politics and ideologies that will drive our country. Truth be told, opposition politics is very tough, and only the committed and true believers see the truth. Opposition politics carries its own pain everywhere and indeed has been the subject of a book called, quote, How to Be in Opposition, Life in the Political Shadows, end of quote. It was a book written by, edited by Nigel Fletcher and it provides very useful insight into the challenges of being in opposition and it also provides some useful tips. Now let me share one tip with you. He subtitles this tip, Choose Your Weapons Wisely. And this is what he says, quote, an opposition cannot compete with the government on resources. So you must be inventive. In what is a David and Goliath contest, you can use the advantages of greater agility to aim your slingshot where it can do the most damage. Parliamentary ambushes, media attacks, and effective research 
will wear down ministers and help to expose their mistakes. End of it. If the opposition is here, I hope they are listening. <laughs> As you may have heard, in this part of the world, the party in power will accuse you of trying to bring down the government. But truly, this is a tissue of nothing but lies. They have lied about security. The first thing they said was that those who are undermining security were in the government. That was the first thing. Now the story has changed. They say it is the opposition. So all of these things will come. But let me say that this is quite not the same thing as bringing down the country. Because government can be removed by legitimate and constitutional means at the ballot box. Again, according to Nigel Fletcher, quote, bringing down the government was a peculiar day job, and it is. But that is really only the negative side of the job description. With equally lofty ambition, the positive side of opposition could be summed up as, quote, trying to change the world. End of This surely must be something worth doing. Perhaps when all these issues have been put in a proper place, can we then begin to talk of the people of the party and what defines the party? This is the difference between a manifesto which can change. And I want to spend a little time on this. Because for a long time, the way we have approached the development of manifestos was to cast a manifesto for a party over a long period. And the little research that I have done is that the manifesto of the oldest political parties in the world changed from election to election as a response to the issues that challenged their nation at the time. So we must also begin, as we rebuild our political parties, to understand that over a four-year period, the challenges can change. And therefore, the manifestos must be responsive to deal with those challenges. So we cannot have manifestos that are cast on seven cardinal points for all time. And in this sense, I think, therefore, we must draw the distinction and resist the temptation to understand a manifesto as a party platform. They are quite two different things. And I say, therefore, that it is in the party platform where you can have something almost cast in stone. But even then, with age, it is possible to make minor amendments. This is where the ideology of the party will lie in its platform statement. And I say that this is the DNA of the party. It is very difficult to change. And the nearest to it, since the Action Group was formed in 1951, is the All Progressives Congress Code of Ethics, unveiled at its inaugural summit this year on the 6th of March. It is important to remind ourselves what those codes were. And they are 10 in all. And I will not take time to read them here. But except to say that for those who are interested, you will find these codes on the party's website. Now, the existence of these codes leads inexorably to how the parties are managed. Who leads them? What type of experience do those people have? When and where are their meetings held? And how are decisions taken at the meetings? Finally, it raises questions about what the process of choosing representatives of the party in terms of its elected officials are and will be, and also how do its flag bearers emerge? What role do debates play and public discussions around this process? What is the efficiency of primaries conducted for this process? And where do we, for example, draw the difference between Godfatherism and endorsement? Because I see that the debate continues, but the truth is that it seems in very honest cases, we have misunderstood 
endorsements for Godfatherism. And endorsements are the necessary process for the emergence of candidates. And at least in the primaries leading to the last uh, democratic elections, I think 2008, we saw endorsements from state to state. And it was given by the big hitters. In fact, they called them super delegates. And the endorsements were defined. But they did not stop any other candidate from contesting. But they said, this is where we will pitch our votes within this party. And I think those are very deep issues about party, party organization, party development that we must take a second look at. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have taken some time, even in summary form, to highlight some of the bridges that I think that we must cross in order to deepen democracy. These are only some of the challenges that a democratic environment and consequently a democratic government faces. We also have to draw the distinction honestly whether the elected governor of a state or the elected president of a country will automatically be the leader of the party. Where will the checks and balance lie? Who will ask them whether the party manifestos are actually being implemented when they have become leaders and unquestionable about the party? It seems to me. to me that countries that have managed to deliver development with democracy got one thing right. They built strong political parties. And I draw the distinction, their parties are busy every day, every month, every week, over time. So far, it seems that our parties are active once in four years. And so we must develop something that keeps the party machinery going on a day-to-day -day basis whether they are elections or not. The makings of this were appearing in the SDP and NRC day until the annulment of June 12. Thankfully, today, the All Progressive Congress provides the opportunity for a rebirth with the broad base from which this coalition is formed. That in itself is a challenge, which if overcome and harnessed, provides very deep diversity from which to project strength and national unity. Now, having dealt with political parties, people and membership, I now go to leadership of government. Until recently, we all used to think that our national development was inhibited by the fact that we never had a university graduate as leader of any national government in an executive capacity. This perhaps alludes only faintly to some of what I have discussed about the elite consensus, but it is not quite the same. Thankfully, the myth of graduate leadership, as desirable as it is, has now been exploded. We now have two graduates, a zoologist and an architect, at the helm of our national affairs. And I think that the majority of Nigerians will tell you today that their lives are worse off today than they were four years ago. <laughs>